This is your host, Eric Akopin of CivilMet, and we are honored to be joined today by world-famous sociologist Georgi Derlugan, who is a lecturer and a professor at NYU Abu Dhabi, a man who I've had frequent exchanges with, and I can say if, uh, if you're not learning from him, you're not listening to him. Uh, it's great to have you on our show. Thank you. Uh, obviously, uh, you're not a military expert and you're not a political expert, so what I want to talk to you about is about the sociological aspects of the war. Uh, one of the things that has struck me is in the past 22 days, the way this society has responded to the war on a social scale in the sense that you've had almost everyone do their part on some level to the, to the extent of their ability. Uh, food being gathered, refugees being housed, uh, almost everyone went on cue to do things, almost like bees in a bee colony, without ever being told. You know, my 14-year-old who grew up in the United States is at a post office, you know, boxing food. How do you explain this reaction and the way the society has reacted to this war? Well, the stronger the in external threat, the stronger the internal solidarity. Uh, this was postulated by French sociologist Emile Durkheim more than 100 years ago. Apparently it remains true. You can see the opposite actually in many Western societies, you know, where the threat doesn't seem to be very much present and the internal dissent or internal strife is at almost frightening levels now. So in a very ironic sense, Armenia is inside Armenia is one of the safest places and most relaxed. You know, that this is that proverbial place where you don't need to lock your car. You know, that uh, wallets probably would be returned, especially now. Uh, but this comes at a very terrible price. And that price has the name of genocide, right? You know, so this is a post-genocidal nation. It's a very dire, you know, good forbid anybody, you know, survive such um, experience. But what could be worse than going through another genocide? So this is what is happening, you know, and this is why we direly need this solidarity, you know, because this is a dark hour, you know, everything is uh, in balance. So this is not just the pandemic killing people, which it which is doing, you know, that this is a threat of existential extent to the nation, which brings it together, which brings together people in the diaspora. I think, you know, it also brings the worst in some people, you know, that there are people, of course, you know, who try to leave. I know that there are uh, cleavages in families, and this is actually normal. You know, when mothers are afraid to lose their sons, for good reason, when sons are trying to escape the control of their mothers. But I also see a lot of resolve. You know, so many people who say, and that includes myself, you know, I could have moved out. You know, I'm, sure I'm not from Armenia. I'm only one quarter Armenian, if you want to you know, discuss that uh, in, in such terms. Only one of my grandfathers, from whom I inherited the last name, was an Armenian. Uh, however, you know, it, in face of such adversity, many people say we stay and we stay together. And as a sociologist, I would say that uh, it's actually a, as long as this place exists and it will exist while there are people and they're prepared to fight, this is a comfortable place actually to live mm -hmm. and to be an old man. That's quite fascinating. One of the things that has struck me uh, is the virulence of this Turkish Azeri Armeni, Armeni, Armeniophobia? I guess it, I guess it's a fairly new term. And uh, this, in the way, obviously, social media always brings the worst in people in what you see. But uh, I've worked in American politics for thirty years, and I've dealt with, sat down with, uh, seen the worst kind of racist, generally white people in the United States, and even the most virulent of them will never tell you we want to kill all black people. They will never say we want to, you know, uh, kill every last Mexican. 
Uh, they will say they should go live somewhere else. I don't want them next to me. There is a almost uh, pathological sense to this. You know, the great Persian poet uh, Hafez had a line about you know the uh, the words we speak is the house we live in. What house do they live in that they think like this or say things like this? First of all. Let's not overextend the argument. You, know, you, you started by saying something very important. Social media brings out usually the worst in people. So this is not an exhaustive uh, picture. Fortunately, we know that in Azerbaijan there exist such courageous people as the writer Akram Ailisli. And there are others. You know, many of them are in emigration. Uh, the same applies to Turkey even more. We know that there are other Turks. And in fact, it's uh, not for nothing you know, that Erdogan loses elections in the biggest Turkish cities. You know. It's not necessarily that they are nicer people, but he has lots of opponents domestically. Which also uh, shows you know, that both Aliyev and Erdogan need to mobilize the people with less certain identity, the people who are marginal between village life and city life. You know, people in, in city life are uh, people who are comfortable in cities. They're citizen, that's it. You know. They are much more relaxed about religion or anything else. Peasants in villages actually are also quite relaxed about religion, simply because these are daily rituals. You know, they do what their parents, the great grandparents, everyone around them are doing. There are many people who are in a limbo space between village and big city. This began in uh, Turkey in the 1960s and 1970s. This is what had happened in Europe, actually. But in Europe, it passed in the 19th century largely unnoticed, you know, because people were also leaving not just for big cities and becoming their proletarians or you know, workers, they were leaving for colonies. They were going to Canada or Australia and becoming something else there, much more comfortably. Uh, here, there are so many Turks from uh, Inner Anatolia. We have these demographic processes, you know, we have the data, you know, mo moving, if they can, to Istanbul, but if they can, even better, you know, they would move to Germany, of course, you know, because this, is, this would be a big city. It happens also to many Armenians, you know, who move to either Russia or California. Uh, in Azerbaijan, it went more dramatically. Uh, let me remind you, you know, there used to be, in Soviet times, 400,000 ethnic Armenians in Azerbaijan, right, at least. You know, what actually happened was a massive population exchange. There were rural Azeris living in Armenia, and there were mostly urban Armenians living in Baku and Kerababad, which is now Ganja. So what happened to the apartments of those people? You know, so Ar the Armenian Azeris probably, you know, their houses were abundant, you know, because, because um, they were rural and nobody was much interested in this very difficult land. Uh, in Azerbaijan, actually, you know, they were in Baku, you know, there were some of the best apartments. Armenians, you know, occupied good positions. And by the way, it's an interesting argument, you know, that, look, Armenian refugees, there are so many from Azerbaijan. Where are they? They're not in ca camps. They're all around. They found their way. You know, they were professionals. They had commercial skills. You know, kind of the, uh, they were good Armenians who found their way somewhere in the world. And that's a separate story, you know, for Baku, Bakinsi Armenians, you know, to maintain uh, their solidarity, you know, to remember who they are. But what happened to Azerbaijani refugees, you know, what, I don't think you know, this is simply because Azerbaijani propaganda likes to parade the misery of their refugees. You know. But these people had few skills, uh, not much human or other capital, and many of them are in very difficult uh, situations. However, some of them, and that's a very good and nasty question, many of them moved into the apartments of Armenians. So as uh, I maintain contacts with some of my Azerbaijani classmates, old friends, so they used to joke bitterly in the 1990s that 
gold hands left, gold teeth. You know, these people, rural people with gold teeth moved in. Uh, that the city, which boasted some of the uh, most interesting jazz festivals in the Soviet Union in, back in the 1950s and 60s, right? That city is orientalizing, you know, massively. One of Azerbaijani refugees, and there are Azerbaijani top refugees, you know, so men who used to be, to have a big position, you know, in Soviet Azerbaijani government, he emigrated with the words to his family that we are not going to stay with these people in this city any longer. It's unsafe. So what is happening, you know, that I, I think, you know, the, this kind of uh, migrants from rural area are not quite sure in their own identity. The world looks quite hostile to them because they have very few tools to negotiate their entrance into this world. This is happening, of course, among Muslims in, in Europe as well. Uh, it's very difficult to help them and in a situation like Azerbaijan or Turkey, you know, not many people, not many government agencies are even helping. You know. However, they can be mobilized. They could be very angry. They could be very angry at many things. And that anger could be channeled. By external enemies. Yeah, and, but the best enemy, in a sense, is the enemy which is external and internal, both, you know, kind of devil among us, you know, so they are lurking somewhere, you know, so they are, uh, why such massacres? You know, massacres usually occur, or pogroms, against the people you fear, like Jews used to dominate the world, you know, so that was the, the, the Jews everywhere, look, the Wall Street are Jews, the Soviet government, is mostly Jewish in the 1930s, you know, so this was the view of the Nazis, you know, that they control the world, you know, we are heroically uh, fighting, and if we don't eliminate them, they would eliminate us. So this picture of the world. So I don't want to overstate the argument, however, the, the very dire conclusion, which kind of suggests itself, is that we watch we observe something which is not unlike the 1930s interwar Europe. And this anger could be mobilized for many different purposes. People could turn religious. When life sucks, you know, people could go on drugs, could become criminals, but they also could go on pogroms. Yeah. Uh, one question that has dominated the war and it's, um, much of its coverage has been the issue of uh, these mercenaries being brought in to fight for the Azeri side, these jihadist mercenaries. And which leads to my question about, uh, you have an opponent in this case that has a military budget that is six times more than Armenia's, on average, if people, if the numbers are accurate. Uh, three times the population. Uh, in today's battlefield, it controls the air because of the drones, which is vital in any war if you want to advance. Uh, it's got the complete, utter integration and backing of the second biggest army in uh, NATO. Uh, Turkish special forces on the ground. Uh, you have all of those advantages and you need jihadist headcutters. What is the rationale? What, what does that tell you about their mindset that they would, that they would use people of that kind? Very difficult to reason for the people who are so different from you. So what we observe, it's actually a general rule. You know, we can deduce if there is any battle plan or any diplomatic plan from piecing together the action. You know. So what, what might be the plans of Washington or Moscow? In this case, uh, why would you need these jihadis? who are probably not technically sophisticated, uh, maybe just a psychological threat. Exactly, you know, that these are not even ordinary Azerbaijanis. These are people, you know, who have the experience of Aleppo. And one of the possibilities, if they fail to take, say, Stepanakert, turn it into another Aleppo, you know, destroy it, uh, engage people in uh, street battle and for this you would need to you know the expandable uh, cheap military 
Uh, we see it actually you know, being used in Libya, in Syria, or so-called you know, proxy wars. You know, that, uh, the people for whom you have no responsibility before your own uh, citizen. You know, because it was quite obvious you know, that Armenians have the skills and the spirit, and they have uh, good weapons of the late 20th century vintage. Right, so those drones created a new situation on the ground and in the air, which is very tragic, which is very much watched around the world, as I understand, by military uh, experts. But distance war never captures ground. You know, it can destroy, but then you know, there still will have to be infantry going on. And if there is any Armenian infantry left, they will fight back ferociously. So in order to overcome that and you know, suffer casualties and discard those casualties you know, as uh, you know, to wild beasts, uh, you need expendable, cheap allies from the third world, where the human life is valued very little. But you also probably use them uh, as scare tactics, you know, that these are beasts. You know, these are not ordinary soldiers, you know, so they are coming for ethnic cleansing. Because as, essentially, you know, the, the aim of this campaign is ethnic cleansing, of course. Nobody really needs Armenian minority in Azerbaijan. All right, so that's uh, the best guess I could offer. Uh, my last question is, it touches more on the war. And uh, for more than three weeks now, this sort of the citizen democratic army, which is Armenia's army of every teacher and taxi driver and 18 year old and 19 year old and uh, from frankly all classes. Uh, it's a very democratic army. Uh, the prime minister's son is at the front. The deputy prime minister's brother is at the front. Uh, has been involved in probably the heaviest fighting in Europe since World War II just in sheer scale and the weaponry used. This is nothing compared to the 1990s Yugoslavia or the war in Karabakh in the 1990s. And uh, I think contrary to the beliefs of most people or expectations of most people, uh, not only has this army for the most part held its own up until yesterday when they obviously clearly retreated from some areas, uh, has essentially wiped out the armor of the other side up to the 70th, 80th percentile. Now, if you see Azeris advancing now, they advance in buses and trucks and things of that nature. It's not even in tanks and APCs anymore. Uh, how do you explain this resistance when most other armies would have folded long ago? Oh, we live through a very special moment. I you know, so this is very much like Battle of Britain, you know, never so many oaths, so much to so few, yeah, uh, to so few, and they feel it, and they must feel it in the battlefront, you know, that they have support of all Armenians all around the world. They must also feel that they would be very welcome back home, that there will be a lot of support. That, and we will need to show this support to many families uh, because there are grieving families already. There are 700 dead. You know, that's just the, the ones accounted for. But you're right, you know, so the behavior of Armenian army or Armenians army, you know, the Artsakh army and the government agencies you know, was exemplary. You know, they're quite honest, you know, so to the extent, you know, that what is possible in wartime situation, you know, they admit their losses, you know, they're not trying to dump them like the, the enemy somewhere secretly. Uh, they admit that this is huge hardship. And frankly, you know, it takes a miracle and they're performing a miracle that the defenses did not collapse in the first days. So now, of course, you know, this is another very dire moment when after three weeks of fighting, they must be resupplied. And we have two roads, as you remember, you know, and people must go in and go out. Uh, there is, I don't know to what extent, you know, air domination by the enemy. 
Because at this point, you know, Armenians direly need anti-aircraft weapons. You know, it doesn't take a military expert to tell. Uh, you and however, you know, as long as there is a possibility of holding the positions, I think Armenians are prevailing. You know, simply because there are not so many. You know, but they are far more committed. You know, all military experts agree on that. You know, that Armenians are outgunned massively outgunned and outnumbered, but the quality of soldiers is very high. And this is exactly because, as you mentioned, you know, this is an interclass alliance within a nation. You know, this is very different, by the way, you know, from Azerbaijan, which is uh, a petrostate. It's essentially a monarchy. You know, its father and son have been holding to power since 1969, you know, with a few years uh, during Perestroika you know, when they were out of power and then Aliyev comes back. Uh, apparently all the oil wealth, you know, even Azerbaijani official statistics, you know, which are always very suspect, you know, that they're embellishing uh, their situation, but even that shows a huge gap between a chosen few, very few, who are extremely wealthy at the top, and the rest, which is pretty much like any post-Soviet uh, Republic, you know, that the oil wealth did not trickle down there. And this is one of the reasons why they need this war. Well, uh, Professor Derudian, thank you for joining us. It was quite enlightening, our conversation was. Uh, I appreciate you joining us. Uh, this is your host, Reverend Kopian Sebonet. Thank you for joining us.